Hello and welcome to Bread and Thread, a podcast about food and domestic history. I'm Liz. And I'm Hazel. We're two friends who studied archaeology together and love history. And sorry, I'm still cracking up about being dad. So much. Um, I'm just going to put it put it out there before we do the making and baking. This episode is on can openers because of Bean Dad. I just every time I hear the words Bean Dad. <laughs> So what have you been making? Um, well, for insert midwinter celebration here, um, I got Nick a brewing kit. Oh, wow. So we currently have some bitter ale in a big bucket t- turning into beer in the kitchen. You have life in your kitchen. We've named it Steve. <laughs> At the suggestion of Pencil from Probably Bad. And when would one get to taste Steve's juices? Well, theoretically it should be done tomorrow. But because our house is not a consistent 18 degrees Celsius, because that would be incredibly expensive, um, it might take a few extra days. But the kit came with a hydrometer, so I can keep an eye on it. Oh, excellent. Yeah, which means I can also calculate the ABV, which is very exciting because I like science. I was going to say, that sounds a lot more like efficient and high tech than my brewing process, which is just like put sugar and yeast and fruit in bucket, leave for some time, hope there is alcohol. We did the dump everything in a big plastic bucket thing. Mm -hmm. Um. But, you know, the hydrometer is useful so you know how much of it you can have before you're drunk. And also so that you know if it's done. I feel like it is a good idea to know the ABV. Like, that's that's good. Especially since we're we're planning to save some of it for the aftertimes, whenever that is. So it would be useful to be able to, like, inform other people how alcoholic it is. (laughs) I look forward to the day when I can taste Steve. <laughs> I'm very excited. We we have post Steve plans. <laughs> it sounds very ominous, but I just mean trying to make mead and stuff. Oh, that's really exciting. I've never had homemade mead. I think Nick also found something where you can make beer with a sourdough starter, and you know we have one of those. Okay. <laughs> So that would that would be a fun experiment. Yeah, that's like a whole new world of alcohol. I mean, it, it is the classic though, isn't it? Because, I mean, bakers used to give brewers some like leftover yeast or starter and stuff like that to make their beer in like the olden days. Yeah. The, the industries we... were entirely connected through sharing yeast. And it developed into one of the most important industries of Britain today, the Marmite industry. Oh, (sighs) I don't like Marmite. I just, I don't like it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't. Um, I, for one, am a devoted admirer (laughs) of Marmite. I, I love it so much. Which, now that I think about it, like, there's absolutely no reason that I should, apart from, I, I don't know, I just, like, something deep inside me likes the mermaid. <laughs> Unrelated, but we seem to be on a, a bit of a tangent spiral. Um, found out that cats really like yeast, and apparently that's why they steal bread. They like the smell of yeast, so now I want to give a cat mermaid. Ah. I've never felt more related to a cat than right now (laughs) like it's something we can all enjoy the smell of fresh bread if you're listening and you have a cat please offer it marmite (laughs) i need to know what happens for science let us know so what have you been making you've been continuing to finish off things (laughs) um yeah i finished the hat um i can't remember if i had finished it last time um so i finished the hat i'm working on this jacket um 
And oh, what else? Um, I've been doing a fair amount of um, cross stitching things because that's very satisfying right now. Um, and I think my next project will be making a dress form because I have a little bit of um, Christmas money and bootstrap dress forms are apparently um, fairly relatively cheap to make. So I'm gonna go down that road and finally have a dress form and then I can drape things. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, um, bootstrap, I think they're called, is it bootstrap fashion or? Let me just check. Um, yeah, they're called bootstrap fashion. Um, so you can send them all of your measurements and they will send you like a custom pattern for a dress form. So you have to make it yourself. Um, so like you do need to have like probably a sewing machine and like know how to sew and stuff. Um, but for that reason, it is a lot more affordable than like buying a custom made dress form like from what that's already made um so i'm i'm gonna go for that and we'll see how it goes <laughs> that that is very cool yeah i kind of feel like like an actual person who sews things now <laughs> 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 like, I mean, I still kind of don't really know what I'm doing, but, you know, it makes me look like I know what I'm doing if I have a dress form in my room. Plus, I can dress it up in things and put it right in front of the door to scare people. If you're ever home alone, you'll be sorted. <laughs> yeah, I can also scare off burglars with it. <laughs> <laughs> I might give it a face. How terrifying would that be? Very, considering most dress forms don't have heads. <laughs> yeah, but I could just, you know, stick one on. Torso, face, face on the torso. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so what are you going to tell us about today? Um, well, as, as I said, I have been reading about can openers. I realise when this goes up, this will no longer be a thing people are talking about. For the moment, we're topical. We are. <laughs> that, that's how we work. We're topical when we record, not necessarily <laughs> when the episode goes out. But, you know, it, it counts. So do you want to explain the whole Bean Dad situation for anyone who uh, doesn't live on the internet? Um, okay, so basically... Um, Internet dweller and musician John Roderick um, spent six hours telling his daughter to figure out how to use a can opener rather than teaching her how to use a can opener. And yeah, turns out that's bad parenting. <laughs> <laughs> and so Bean Dad's trended on Twitter for two days. It's, um, I. You know, as one of the first notable, like, internet happenings of 2021, it's... Oh, gosh. Like, I didn't, I didn't see this one coming. No, but, I mean, the, the internet year is off to a start. <laughs> it certainly is. I mean, that's just taking the Socratic method way too far. Like, it's a valid technique for helping people learn stuff. But like, it's a valid technique until the child doesn't eat for six hours. I mean, it's it's not like that. That kind of teaching method is not saying, "Oh, just figure it out." It's like helping, asking the right questions in order to guide somebody towards something. <laughs> like, yeah. What? I really hope he doesn't teach her to cook because she will burn the the house down while oh, he's oh doing gosh. the kitchen, presumably. <laughs> How do I drive this car? I'll just figure it out. You, you know, got to learn sometime. But anyway, outdated <laughs> um, internet trivia aside, 
Um, can openers, tin openers, whatever you want to call it, the, the tool for opening food sealed in a special metal container. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, there's never one when you want one. Absolutely not. <laughs> but I haven't really thought much about their history before, so I'm interested. Um, so I will talk about canned food another time because I do want to just focus on the opener this time because there's a surprising amount to say. It seems like there might be a lot there. Um, but basically, tinned food originally was basically opened with a hammer and chisel, including yeah, instructions actually on cans of food saying, quote, cut round the top near the outer edge with a chisel and hammer. Like this what? was the expected method. Bear in mind at this point, the cans were heavier than the food inside them because it was the like late 18th, early 19th century. Okay. And it's, wow. it was a, a relatively niche thing because it was mostly for the military at this point. And we didn't have industrial warfare yet, so it's relatively niche. Mm -hmm. I Yeah, I mean, I feel like as a way of preserving food, like people kind of had other methods at this point. And I mean, it, it is effective, but I don't know how effective early canning would be at preserving food. Yeah, and a lot of what we now refer to as canning even now can be putting stuff in glass jars with metal lids like mm. i know in the us is a thing of uh, canning homegrown produce by putting it in like a mason jar or something similar which is a glass jar with a metal lid okay so stuff like kilner jars and like like it's oh no wait i'm confusing so Kilner jar, I guess I'm referring to the glass jar with metal lid, but they can also be like the um, hinge sealed ones. Yeah, sealed um, ones. I believe Kilner jars and Mason jars are the same. And then, yeah, there's also the ones with the hinged handle. Okay. Which are also made by Kilner, but the sort of the Kilner jar TM is the same as a Mason jar. Just oh, I see. clarifying for listeners in different places it's the thing where you have a jar you put a circle of metal on top and then you screw something on okay and I, I know what we're on now yeah but yeah um an inventor called uh, peter durand was making these iron and tin alloy cans um but yeah they were very thick but eventually, um, different industrial technology meant that you could make thinner tins. Um, so you develop onto the can opener that looks kind of like a crab claw, where you basically go round the edge of the top of the tin, cutting into it. Um, which is the kind that you get in a Swiss Army knife. Oh, I see. So crab claw is just the 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 way that it looks to me is because you've got the long pointy bit and then the shorter less pointy bit. Yeah, so like it's not it's not cutting out the top. It's kind of like piercing it. Yeah, you, um, you, piece you just it have all to go around. all the way around doing that. Yeah. So that was invented in 1855 by a surgical instrument maker. Which I guess there's a lot of overlap, but it's, it's something handheld that cuts things. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, can surgery, who knew? They did surgery on a can. <laughs> I mean, it does sound a bit more efficient than the hammer and chisel. Mm. But like I said, this was only doable because they'd managed to invent thinner walled cans. Hmm. But interestingly, um, yeah, the, that kind of opener was popular during the American Civil War, but it was also deemed too dangerous for domestic use. 
Okay. I will remind you that this is the normal kind of travel tin opener that you get in a Swiss Army Knife and similar stuff. I, but yeah, I guess, I mean, but I guess th- those are for manly men out in the world who don't have time for the turny things. There are knives in the kitchen. Surely that's also dangerous for domestic use. I believe it's something to do with... Because they... I mean, I've used this kind of turn up now. They do have a tendency, if you don't exactly know what you're doing, to kind of slip off and there's a potential of slicing your arm open. Okay, yeah, I, I can see that, but... Um, it, like, I definitely see why, but at the same time, like... It doesn't sound more dangerous than other kitchen implements. Or a chisel. Yeah. <laughs> So a safer version of that was was then developed um, for specifically for pickled beef, um, known as bully beef. So that that rings a bell. Is that to do with military supply as well? Um, so it was a a general preserved meat thing in the U.S., but it was also a part of military rations, which is why we have that military association because it was with the army longer than it was in domestic use. Okay. Um, have you ever bought a tin of corned beef or Spam and it has that turning key on it? Oh, um, not for a long time. Uh, but I know what you mean. So the guy that patented this, I love his name, is Jay Osterhout. Um, Excellent. I probably said that wrong. Um, but yeah, in 1866. Because, um, yeah, the, the lever tin opener wasn't really a big thing at this point still. Mm-hmm. So he invented this key that you could basically attach to a flap of metal on the tin and then just basically slowly rip the tin open. <laughs> um, which, yeah, you'd, you'd have to have a different kind of key for different shapes of tin, though, because different foods were sold in different shapes of tin, like they still are. Okay. And, I mean, some things like canned milk, you still had to puncture, which I guess isn't as bad when it's liquid, because you just need a hole rather than to open the whole thing yeah i mean i, I guess you're still going to need some kind of can opening tool because you don't like not every can you can buy is gonna be the same yeah and i mean when you've got um places like um yeah there's an account from connecticut um not long after the american civil war which basically states that clerks in shops would open the tins for customers because okay. people just found that safer, which I feel <laughs> defeats the point somewhat. Because I understand, you know, you're canning food at the source and then shipping it around. But if you're then getting it opened out of the shop, you've got a very limited time frame where that food is food. Yeah, and then also it has to survive the journey to your house without yeah, getting it everywhere. I, mean, I feel like there's a reason the that sort of claw shaped opener never really became a big hit. <laughs> um and then eventually, very eventually, in the 1890s you get a can opener with a serrated wheel mass produced it was patented like 20 years earlier but the mass production took a while to to kick off and then in in 1920 they figured out adding a second wheel to hold onto the can might be a good idea I was going to say, it sounds like (laughs) equally as dangerous without that. So we're talking almost 150 years between 
canned food and a reasonable can opener. <laughs> That's got to be one of the most long-awaited inventions. Yeah. It's the one that meant that you could open the can without also having to hold on to the can. <laughs> Which, I mean, even modern can openers leave kind of a sharp edge. So I can imagine that was quite a useful innovation. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you still have to be careful. Like it's very easy to injure yourself on an opened can today. Mm. So I guess the the um, invention is still out there. Like the perfect can opener has not yet been given to us. The one that like renders the can completely safe <laughs> at the same time as opening it. Yeah, I guess cutting thin metal and having it not be sharp is beyond modern technology. Yeah, I mean, I see how that would be difficult, but like... Well, I mean, if you want to go in the other direction, um, there is the combination can opener and knife sharpener. Um... Okay... You, you know, if if you just live for danger in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> can I open a can and sharpen a knife at the same time? But the, there is there is a modern can opener, which I, I enjoy, which is the One Touch. Okay. Um, invented by Mark Sanders, which basically it clamps on and you mm. press the button and it turns itself around and opens the can which oh, nice. is so good from like an accessibility standpoint it's a one-handed can opener oh, yeah you don't you don't need both hands to operate it yeah and also you don't need like hand strength i guess even the pull top ones yeah you need two hands and you need you know to be able to like peel the thing off because, you know, there are a lot of modern can openers that a nine-year-old, to pull an example from the air, <laughs> might struggle with using just from a physical strength standpoint. Mm. Yeah, and then also, like, as we have just pointed out, um, can lids are sharp. Mm. <laughs> and... For example, a nine-year-old who hadn't opened a can before uh, might not be aware of that. And potentially bad things. Um, but, I mean, you don't need a can opener to open a can nowadays, do you? Because a lot of them do come with ring pulls slash pull tabs slash whatever you want to call them especially um the drinks drinks cans now those are great unless you get one of the ones where you pull it and the tab comes off before you've opened the can yeah Th those aren't ideal you're just like what what am i gonna do now <laughs> my my options are limited <laughs> Although I will admit to being like one of those very, very foolish people who occasionally opens cans with a knife. Just going if full I just like there. soaring into it, yeah. <laughs> if I can't find a can opener, I have been known to do that. Um, I know it's not a great idea, but also sometimes I just really want soup. But yeah, the the ring pull um, seems to have been invented actually in the twenties, but is is still being perfected now. I would say, mm. um, different companies experimenting with different shapes of hole, different shapes of ring pull. Um, you can find online, and if if I can re find it, I'll because I forgot to bookmark it, I'll tweet a link to it. There's a typology of ring pulls 
that someone has painstakingly put together. And I, just, I love people. I've said this before. I love people. I know. Future archaeologists will do that. Future archaeologists are going to love this. Like they will be yes. all over it. Can you imagine if we had that? If like someone had gone through and done like a really accurate taxonomy for like an early Amazing. Viking belt buckles or something and we yeah. had that now. Like at the time that they were made. Oh my god. So um yeah the the final step in can opening technology at the moment seems to be um cogito can. The what um which is a resealable drinks can. Oh. Like you lift the top off and then you put it back on. Wow. Do you used have for a casino's private label energy drink? <laughs> okay. Well, so so it's only... not it's not a casino, it's just a company called Group Casino. Oh. But it is a private label energy drink. A premium makes... energy drink with a resealable can. <laughs> I mean, that makes a lot more sense because I was imagining that you could only get this drink in a specific casino. Which seems a lot to invent something completely new for. I mean, the concept of a, a premium energy drink is still wild to me. Because <laughs> I, I grew up with kids chugging Red Rooster, which just tastes like fizzy apple juice. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what's supposed to set premium energy drinks apart from the others resealable cans apparently <laughs> yes, yeah <laughs> so yeah that wow. is a brief a brief history of can openers tin openers all that jazz i mean all of this confirms my theory that it's the trickiest kitchen device I mean, apparently, it took them that long to just get a usable version. <laughs> like, we've invented this incredibly efficient and fantastic method of preserving food. The only problem is we can't get it out again. Yeah, if people take 50 years from a problem presenting itself to finding literally any solution other than a hammer and chisel... <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, you know, that can be the solution to anything. Maybe? This podcast does not condone chiseling random objects. But I do. 50% <laughs> of this podcast does not condone. <laughs> the opinions of individual podcasters may be different from the official line. <laughs> Hazel views do not represent Bread and Thread Incorporated. <laughs> Cowards. <laughs> I'm Mod Paper from Probably Bad RPG Ideas, and we have a podcast. If you'd like to hear RPG advice on how to use assorted incredibly bad ideas as actual ideas in an actual game, then listen to the Probably Bad podcast, available on pretty much every podcatcher. And remember to have a probably bad day. What What are you going to teach us about? Um, I thought, given that we're still in wintertime mood, I might talk a bit about slow gin. Um, which I guess is quite regional um, for a local larder because slows don't grow everywhere. Um, yeah, so... Slow gin, um, if you've not heard of it before, is a type of flavoured spirit um, that is really traditional in Britain. And um, it's made of gin, sugar and sloes, which are the berries of the hawth uh, sorry, the blackthorn plant. Um, yeah, don't, don't eat hawthorn berries. No, although you can. Um, I mean, you probably wouldn't want to eat them raw, but you can make like a, a fruit leather out of them, apparently. Um, which is a bit of effort, but in, you know, the olden days, you wouldn't want to waste 
any of the fruits or you know things that you found even if they weren't immediately edible <laughs> um, yeah that, that makes sense but also don't <laughs> take hawthorn berries and eat them please um yeah don't um and slows you can't eat as they are either really i mean you could try but it wouldn't be a great time they're notoriously tart and stringent but you can flavor alcohol with them because people are nothing if not inventive when it comes to food and you know people don't want to waste a berry harvest you got to use it somehow um so this is how slow gin developed and it's i really like it um it's it can be drunk uh, neat as opposed to like normally you wouldn't really want to drink gin neat. <laughs> um, but slow gin is sweeter because of the sugar and it has a really nice flavor, I think. Um, and it's it's kind of getting popular again now. So yeah, yeah there's kind of a resurgence of the whole hedgerow food thing generally, I think, in the UK, which is, is quite nice. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's related to foraging becoming like a bit trendy again and stuff, um, and 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 um, the resurgence of some of these more traditional um, like crafts and foods, which is nice. Um, so and it's this beautiful ruby red color as well. Um, it's just yeah, it's it's really nice. I like a slow gym. Um, but there's a lot more to it. Then I realized at first. So um, slow gin goes back quite a long way, but not a massively long way. Um, so it became it became a thing really in the 18th century because of two things. Firstly, because of sugar becoming a lot cheaper, um, because of colonialism I guess um, and secondly because of the enclosure acts uh, passed by parliament the notorious enclosure act uh, passed by parliament to enclose common land into private land owned by the gentry and that meant a lot of hedges being planted to close off the land and one of the most popular plants to use in those hedges was blackthorn because it's very spiky and dense and keeps people out and livestock in. And so there was this sudden abundance of slows everywhere. And people were like, oh, we better use these because people are great. So slow gin became, it, it was kind of like a, it was something you made at home. Um, like you, you wouldn't really go out. I don't think there was anywhere that was making slow gin. Gin was very popular um, in this period as well. Um, yeah, I think we've we've talked about we, mother's ruin before. <laughs> we've gone over that in a previous podcast. <laughs> um, but not all the gin that was being made was, shall we say, great quality. Um, uh, I mean, some of it was what you might think of as moonshine today. Some of it would be just like really kind of poorly made gin. Um, so basically the cheaper stuff, which is what you would be buying if you were not rich, um, wasn't like the greatest tasting. And so slow gin kind of was a way to improve the flavor, especially now that you could get sugar. And you had all these these free slows that you could use to to improve the flavor. So it was something that would be made at home um, and it got a bit of a reputation for being like the, the poor man's port or like this um, this spirit that was associated with the working classes. I guess that makes sense. Um, yeah, it does. And I think that um, I think that's to an extent still true today because a lot of people, I think, especially um, if the fa family is from the countryside, will remember like, oh, my grandma used to make slow gin or something like that. Um, and it it never really 
caught on as a more mainstream thing um, until the early 20th century. So, um, oh, just in case anyone's interested as well, um, an ancient hedgerow is defined as a hedgerow that was in place before the Enclosure Acts. So you can kind of tell which one it is because a hedgerow that was planted as part of the Enclosure Acts or was, was planted since will contain a lot of blackthorn and a lot of um, these, these kind of woody shrubs um, that were used, that were planted, you know, for that purpose of like enclosing the land. Whereas an ancient hedgerow, a hedgerow that was in place before that, will have, um, apparently the definition is, it should have five or more native species in it. So a lot more diverse, like a lot Sweet. more, yeah, um, it's, it's cool. Um, a lot more kind of different plants um, rather than more the same stuff. Um, that was just put up quick to enclose things like quick and efficient. Um, and slows are actually like it. It can be difficult to different. Uh, a lot of D's. It can be difficult to differentiate <laughs> between slows and damsons um, because slows, damsons, and bullises, which is a great word. Um, are uh, all kind of similar looking small bluish black berries. Um, but they all kind of look like baby plums. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, but damson trees um, don't have the spikes on them that blackthorns have. And they do, they look a bit more like mini plums um, because they've got like a stem coming from them. Whereas slows, are more close to the, the stem of the plant. So that's how you can tell. So it wasn't until the late 19th century that this homemade spirit started to be produced in like commercial distilleries um, and started, I guess they were picking up on it being quite a popular thing by that point to make at home. Um, although it should be... <laughs> It's interesting that there was also a large temperance movement um, in this period, particularly in the late 19th um, and Edwardian period. Um, so there's, yeah, the, there's a lot of temperance, a lot of anti-alcohol sentiment going around, but people are still making this. So it makes you wonder how many people were like, oh, yes, I support the temperance movement and secretly making slow gin back at home. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying that people might be hypocritical sometimes? Um, absolutely not. Um, so it got a bit more fashionable, a bit more well known in the twentieth century, particularly the nineteen twenties. Um, I guess the golden age of cocktails. Um, the slow gin fizz was invented. So that's a cocktail that involves gin and champagne. And apparently, in some cases, egg white, which doesn't sound that appealing. But I, oh, I guess yeah, egg white is in a lot of cocktails to make it just kind of fizzy and frothy. Yeah, it produces like a big, a big froth, right? Um, yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe, uh, well, maybe it's. Yeah, I've never actually had one. That's on my list. I, I've got to try a slow gin fizz. Um, and that, that remained popular up until about the 1960s when it kind of fell out of fashion, I guess, with a lot of things that were seen as more traditional and stuffy um, mm. kind of fell out of fashion. And it's only now that it's starting to come back because now it's seen as something nostalgic and natural. <laughs> which is, is kind of the trend at the moment. Um, and I guess because um, it's getting more popular to, to do stuff yourself at home and it is something you can do if you live somewhere where there's hedgerows. Yeah. Um, 
So if you want to know how to make slow gin, you identify your slows and you're supposed to pick them traditionally after the first frost. But that comes quite late now in our modern days of global warming, unfortunately. Yeah, I think it's just happened for, for us. Um, yeah, I, it, not that long ago. And, you know, it's so it was like late December, which um, given that slows are ripe around October time um, is, is quite late. So what you can do instead is pick them when they're ripe in October and freeze them. Because the whole point of picking them after the frost is that the skins will be a little bit cracked and so the juices will come out better into your alcohol. So it's like, and, like ice wine. Um, oh, what's ice wine? Um, you pick the grapes when they're all frozen and it makes, I think it's supposed to make the wine sweeter. It's like a oh, German dessert uh, wine. Okay, that's cool. I've never heard of that. I'm going to go look up ice wine. Um. Yeah, so you uh, yeah, you do the same thing with slows. Um, freezing them achieves the same effect. Um, and then you put your slows into a jar. You add sugar. And depend depending on your taste, that can be anything from a few spoonfuls to uh, half as much sugar as slows. So if you like it sweeter, you can put more in. If not, I mean, there's there's recipes for differing amounts that you can find. Um, and then you just fill it, fill it up with gin, and you leave it for a good few months. Um, and you, every so often, you can sort of turn the bottle or shake it up a bit um, to let things sort of diffuse and dissolve. But after at least three months, you will have a drinkable slow gin. They do say it gets better if you leave it longer, um, but not having done a lot of experimenting, I couldn't comment on that. Um, but you will definitely have something that you can drink and will be slow gin after three months. Nice. So there you go. That is very cool. I like. I had a vague idea that slow gin existed and it was made of stuff from hedgerows but i didn't i didn't know all of that yeah it's sort of i mean i didn't until i sort of looked into it a bit more um i knew how to make it i knew it was a traditional thing my grandma made it um i've made it a couple times but i i didn't know the reason why it became popular i guess like i didn't know the enclosure acts and and that sort of thing um, and why there are so many um, blackthorn hedgerows. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And it's interesting how something that I thought was just a traditional rural thing um, actually came about because of bigger events. Um, I, I guess we tend not to think about that um, or we tend not to look into our traditions that much, perhaps. But that's what that's what we're here for. <laughs> that is indeed what we're here for. We we look at things we do with food and go, why do we do that? <laughs> and exactly that intonation. So I mean, I guess we've uh, achieved that pretty good today. So. Thank you for listening. Um, we have a Twitter if you want to. <laughs> if you want to, I don't know, show us pictures of your can openers. <laughs> um, that's just um, at bread and thread. Um, we also have a Patreon, um, bread and thread, if you would like to hang out with us and get some recipes and things um, and if you have any ideas or subjects that you want us to cover you can send us an email at breadandthreadpodcast at gmail.com yeah the next episode is going to be another one where we do a deep dive into a person or a book so if you have any suggestions for that do let us know otherwise i'm probably going to go the obvious route and do mrs beaton oh and um i 
I received uh, an, an original 1960s copy of Bull Cook for Christmas. So I am going to be making some of these recipes and putting pictures on the Twitter. And it's going to be great. Please join me for some interesting recipes and their stories. Please make the Virgin Mary's favourite spinach. I'm going to make the Virgin Mary's favourite spinach. I will also be making... Um, oh, well, I guess I won't because, like, duck is kind of expensive. But um, there is a recipe for Genghis Khan's favourite duck recipe in there. So, Oh, I wish know. I'd known that before Christmas. We had duck. <laughs> I'll send it to you. <laughs> but are you going to make a martini for Bolton? I'm not sure I'll go as far as to make the forbidden <laughs> martini. It's forbidden for a reason. It really is. <laughs> yeah, listen to our episode on the bowl cook if you want to know why the martini <laughs> verboten is verboten. Also, the cover is gold. It's, it's you mean like it's gold. really good? Or it's, oh, it's, it's shiny gold. It's, it's shiny gold. It's a Amazing. shiny gold cookbook. <laughs> please, please tweet out a picture. I will do. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for listening. And we will be back in a couple of weeks. <laughs>